Our Father in heaven, we thank you because you revealed Jesus Christ to us once again. We know that he is the very foundation of our faith, and we know he is the savior of our souls. We know that with him, we cannot sink or be defeated in the battles of life. We know that with him still, all things are possible because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And having him, there is nothing to be discouraged about because he alone is enough to carry us through. He has saved us and he will glorify us. Lord, we're looking up so that we'll get a deeper and richer revelation of Jesus Christ once again in Jesus' name. Amen. That, Lord, all through life, you'll be with us. Amen. You'll support us. Amen. You will uphold us. Amen. And this work you have given us to do, it will prosper through your grace. Amen. And our lives will fulfill the purpose for which we exist. Amen. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. We're starting from Hebrews chapter 11 as we look at the message, Faith for Every Battle. Faith for Every Battle. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Verse 6, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Verse 7, by faith, Noah being warned of God, of things not, yet, not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark, to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Verse 8, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whither he went. Verse 11, through faith, also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged or she accounted, she counted him faithful who had promised. In verse 21, by faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshipped leaning upon the top of his staff. Verse 23, by faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents, because they saw he was a proper child, and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. In verse 30, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. By faith, the hallowed Rahab perished not with them that believed not, when she had received the spies with peace. And what shall I say more? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, and of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jephthah, and of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight 
the armies of the aliens. I have read all these verses for you to understand that when we talk about faith, we're not talking about an interesting subject for uh, religious playboys. We're not talking of something that uh, is a very good understanding to have, whether you are really living or doing the things you ought to do or not. You'll see that these people that were reaching about as heroes of faith, they were not just uh, people that had the ordinary walk of life. They had a call from God. And it was just because of the call that made the faith necessary. If you haven't got anything to cook, you don't need fire to burn. And if you haven't got a call, you don't have the faith that was given specially to the people that had the call. Then also, there were people that had difficulties in fulfilling the call of their lives. And because of those difficulties, they needed faith. If you are uh, having a life as well as an idea that you live on the bed of roses through life, you don't need faith. What are you going to need faith for? What do you need the omnipotent power of God for in your life if there is no difficulty? And then notice that all the things that are written about faith concerning these people related to the things that God was interested about in their lives. For Noah, the most important thing that God was interested about was uh, the ark that he built. For Abel, it was a sacrifice that he offered. For Abraham, it was his call to come out of the land of the Ur and the Chaldeans. And for Sarah, it was for the promised child to come. For Jacob, it was for the inheritance and the blessings of the sons that God had given him. And for Joseph, it was for the fulfillment of the prophecies long time given. How about Moses? Again, it was because of the call that God gave him and the fulfillment of that call. Then talk about Gideon, talk about Jephthah, talk about all those prophets like Samuel and others that he said the time will fail to account for their lives of faith one by one. They related to things that are important to God. And many times there are people that think that faith is such an important thing in life that they want to have. But then the things they want to apply faith to are not things that God is interested in. They just like faith so that they can get this and get this and get that. They have not determined what is the will of God, what is the call of God, and what is the ministry that God has given me. Find it out because God is not going to give a lot of faith or a great faith uh, concerning an individual except in things that are interesting to God, things that God himself is involved with. Not only that, all these people that I've read to you about, they had battles to fight. Some of them fought a lifelong battle. Now, when you read about Abel, it's because of the battle between evil and good, between righteousness and unrighteousness, between Cain um, sacrifice and Abel's sacrifice. It is the battle that brings him to the chapter of faith. Think about Noah. He had to fight a battle in the environment of unbelief, in the world of unbelief. Only his house believed the Lord, the household. And all the other people were unbelieving. They rejected the word of God. And you know that's a great battle. When Jesus said, I've not come to bring peace on the earth, but a sword, that a man's um, force shall be day of his own household, because this one will believe and the other one will not believe, and it's a great battle. And in all the years of not building that ark, it was a battle to build that ark. And all these people that we have in this uh, chapter, they are, pe they are people that faced battles of life. Think about Abraham. What would you think of the battle between Abraham and Lot? Between Abraham and the people he left behind? Between Abraham and the people that he met when he was going on the way to the place God had appointed for him? How about Sarah? What a battle between Sarah and Hagar. What a battle even in the heart 
to believe that God will still bring the child Isaac. And then we read about Isaac. Wasn't there a battle that they fought with him? In all the things that God wanted to prosper him. And he'll make this well, they stop it again. Make this well, they stop it again. And then in his own family, between himself and the wife. Because he loved Esau and Jacob loved, uh, sorry, uh, the wife loved Jacob. What a battle. And to see the battle between those children, Jacob and Esau. We're told here by faith, Jacob. Without faith, that man would have died before the fulfillment of the call of God for his life. It was a long time battle between Jacob and Esau. But faith comes in because it is the faith that gives the victory. Have you ever read about Joseph? Didn't he have battles? Behold, here comes the dreamer. And we'll see what will become of his dreams. Then he was sent into Egypt. In Potiphar's house, what a battle against sin against immorality eventually he had to get into the prison and even right there in the prison he was telling that individual after he had interpreted the dream remember me think on me when it's been good for you wasn't he forgotten what a battle am i going to live in this dungeon forever eventually he was come out he came out of that place but his life was a life of battles fought and battles won how about moses how about Samson? How about Gideon? In fact, they, when you come to the later history, then you have a record of these uh, battles. Not only now family battles, personal battles, but battles with enemy nations. But life is like that. And that is why we're told in the Bible that we need faith for battles. Life is like a battle. The weak will faint before reaching their destination. Now, do you know that in this uh, chapter on faith, there are many people that you've read about in the Old Testament, but their names uh, do not come on in this chapter of faith. Why? Because the Bible is not interested in writing the names on the list or categories of failures. The people that failed, they came out of the list. But the people that succeeded, God is preparing his own people for success and for victory and therefore is bringing before us the picture of the people that trusted him in the fiercest battles of life and they won that's why you don't find the names of some people in here it's not the names and the genealogy that eventually matters it's not the name at the beginning of the bible that really matters neither the names at the beginning of the ministry of christ but the name at the end of the ministry of christ and when you look at the ministry, at the, this little ministry that God has given for these few years, can't we say the same thing? It's not the names that appeared on our workers' list, 1977, that matters. It's the name that appears on the workers' list right now that matters. And when you think about it and you look to the future, it's not the name that appears now on the list that matters. It's the name that appears at the day of the rapture that matters. Because, you see, the Lord is not reckoning with the people that came into uh, the company or the commonwealth of the children of Israel once upon a time, at the time of the beginning. Now, when the whole record is taken eventually, it's looking at the people that have fought a battle, and then they have won. But all the people that fainted before their destination, their names do not appear. Now, they failed or they drew back before achieving the purpose of God's election and ordination. Because we have been, um, what we'll say, opposed to Calvinism, we do not understand the election of God. That there are times, and there is evidence of scripture, that God elects people to some positions in life, and to some ministries in life. And because of that election, of course, uh, it's his grace and sovereignty. But then there is man's responsibility. Eventually, not all the people that are called are justified, and not all the justified are glorified. But the Lord himself is saying that if we know that all things work together for good, and that you are one of the elect of God, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you. 
God's ordination and God's selection have ordained you that you will go forth and bring fruit and that your fruit shall remain. Then if you understand that in this battle of life, there's nothing strange because Satan must fight the will of God. He must fight the purpose of God. I guess if I wasn't important or if I was a non-entity, if God wasn't interested in me, Satan would not also be interested in me. Satan is not interested in things that are useless, things that are of no consequence at all, things that uh, don't matter to his purpose. But if an individual has been called of God, then Satan knows that because God is a God of all wisdom, this individual that has been called of God, he must have some hidden quality and some hidden latent ministry that he doesn't know about, even though he has not known about that ministry and about that call. Once he knows that God has called that individual, he knows that God doesn't call uh, the non-entities and the people that have no consequence at all. He knows that that's a target for him to fight. You know, Moses was called of God. That's why the devil fought. And you know that Abel was to um, go ahead and be the forerunner of the people that will offer acceptable sacrifice. No wonder the devil fought. How about Daniel? Of course, the devil fought. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. What a fight in the land of Babylon. But there are people that do not understand when it's the devil fighting them. And when is the devil waging war against them because of the purpose and the ordination of God in their lives? Let's pick up just um, two of the people I've read about. You can analyze the lives of the other people just like we do these two. Pick up Jacob. How about Jacob's life? It was a long drawn battle. One before he was even born. Now, he wouldn't have known if that wasn't known or revealed to the mother. And you wouldn't know if it has not been revealed to your mother or your father or your pastor. You would have thought that, well, I don't know why I'm just having battles now. Are you just having battles now? Before you were born, you've been having that battle. Mother didn't tell you. Daddy didn't tell you. That's because they didn't have a revelation from God. If they had revelation from God, they would have told you that there was a battle before you were ever born. And before you were ever born again, if you are a person that will go back to God and see the revelations of God, you would have seen that there were battles before you were ever born again. Not only now that you have come into the kingdom. You know, many people, they say, well, I don't understand. Since I became a Christian, these battles have been intense in my life. There was no battle at all before I was born again. Not if you are called of God. Not if you have a ministry to fulfill. Not if your life is important and it is to fulfill the age-long plan and purpose of God. But before Jacob was ever born, there was this battle. And with who? Will the mother? No. Or the father? No. Well, the person he was to fight with for the rest of his life. And not only that, even after they both died, didn't the battle continue between the Edomites and the Israelites? Between the Amalekites and the Israelites, who were the Edomites? They were the descendants of Esau. Who were the Amalekites? They were the descendants of Esau. The battle continued. In fact, you remember that Amalekites produced a man called Agag. And even after Agag had been killed, destroyed by Samuel, but we're told when you come into, uh, when you come into Esther, that Haman the Agagite, he wanted to wipe away all the Jews. Talk about a fight that started before a man was born and then continued after the man had died. But how did that man overcome? You say you are seeing trouble. What trouble have you seen? But all these people we have read about, there was something in their lives, and that thing overcame in the battles of life. With his brother, there was a great battle. With his parents, wasn't there a battle? That Jacob was torn in between. Daddy didn't want to give that blessing. Mommy said, that's the blessing that you want, and you must get it. 
Suppose my father will discover and curse me. Don't think about your father now. Forget him. In fact, if he curses you, the curse will be upon me. My son, go and do what I have said. And the battle that raged in his heart at that time, fierce within and fierce without. And Esau had gone, and he knew that Esau was the age-long enemy. And the mother had told him the story of what happened before they were even born. And he knew that Esau now, of, of course, he was taking the kid. He was taking that animal. But his heart was thinking about, if Esau met me here now, life is ended. But eventually, he got to the father. Why was the father? He didn't want his father to prolong this issue. Now you can read in between the lines. Who are you? I am, Je I am Esau, your son. And then, who is this? The answers were quick, quick, quick. And the, the fathers didn't seem to want to eat immediately. Come and let me smell the clothes you are putting on. Of course, he went. But with one eye, I hope Esau is not coming. He mustn't meet him there. <laughs> if he met him there, that was the end of life. That was a battle. Have you ever been like that? When you are desiring something, and with your mind, it looks like there's an enemy behind you. It's going to crush you. It's going to beat off your head. And it's following you, trailing you everywhere that you go. In the night and in the day, in the sleep. And when you are awake, it appears that that Esau is coming from the farm right now. I hope he doesn't meet me here. Well, he doesn't meet you there, but eventually after you have gone, he heard the story of what you have got. You have become a pastor. You have become a preacher. You have got the Holy Ghost. You have got a great privilege. Did he get it? And Satan fights them all. Because if I've been fighting this person before he was born again, and he became born again, I may lose completely. And I was fighting before he was sanctified, and eventually he became sanctified. Where was I when he was sanctified? Was I too busy going up and down, to and fro? And then he has even got now uh, the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Not only that, he is about to become a missionary. I must fight this person. Otherwise, this, I'm losing this battle already. And Esau made up his mind. He said, our father will soon die. I know the backbone, the one that is cautioning me, restraining me, he will soon die. Now the spirit of the Antichrist already works, but only he who lets will let until he be taken out of the way. You think that only applies to the church. You don't understand it applies to the individual. What the devil would have done, what the spirit of the Antichrist would have done, what the false prophets would have done, and what powers of darkness would have done, but only he who restrains, restrains until he be taken out of the way. But thank God for the believer that the spirit is to abide with us forever. And eventually, after he had got the blessing and said, well, it will come, then the mother called Jacob and said, I must uh, play this thing very well. It will soon be over. I'll send you to Laban. But don't tell your father that we'll discuss this beforehand. And uh, we'll just say you are going to get married over there. But what is marriage? Your life is even more important. But uh, that marriage, we need to use that as a cover note so that you'll get away from Esau. Maybe after some days, his uh, fury and his anger will quench down. Will not be there again. And so uh, uh, the wife uh, of Isaac went to him and said, uh, what shall my life do me? If this uh, young man, if he marries from all these Hittites and all these uh, enemies around us, let him go on to Laban. And uh, without this man being prepared for outside life, without being prepared to go and live in another place, he got to a strange land, got to Laban. And you know that he was there for 20 years. Before he came, the mother who loved him had died. And the father who would have protected him was already dim in eyes, almost dying himself. And Esau himself, when he heard that uh, Jacob is coming, oh, he said he will understand. Very, very quickly, he got 400 mighty men together. Because... He felt he doesn't know how many people he'll be coming from. Before Jacob left, the fight was only between Esau and Jacob. Now as he was coming back, it's not only Esau alone. There were 400 men with Esau. 
that said, if I miss the shooting of the arrow, all these 400 people, I'm not fighting against anybody I don't know. I don't know that he's married Leah. I don't know that he's married Rachel. Neither do I know that he's got uh, children uh, called uh, Reuben, Simeon, or anybody. There's only one person I'm fighting. And you four um, hundred people, there's only one person you are fighting. He looks like me, but I don't like him. We're twin brothers. If you see him, just make sure that he's destroyed. And the servants went. And uh, he had to be asking, who do you belong to? Who are you? And they said, we are coming from uh, your servant, from your slave, from your brother, from the person who loves you, from the person who has been thinking of you. They said everything. He said, go and tell him. It's not my servant. I'm coming with 400 men. Tell him to get prepared. And that man became afraid. He thought battles were over in the house of Laban. And said, ten times have you changed my wages all this period, except that the God of my fathers have been with me. He would have sent me away empty-handed. He thought he was fighting. He thought it was a battle. And said, I've never seen a battle like this before. Ten times you've changed my wages. And you've been deceptive and you've just uh, taken me out of my inheritance. Now when will I prepare for my own? And eventually he ran away. And while he was coming, Laban came to meet him. And, but the Lord warned him and said, This person you are running after, don't do anything against him. I have need of him. I'm the one that told him to go away. So don't touch him. And Laban said, he was still furious and angry, and said, Except the Lord, the God of your fathers, appeared to me yesterday night, I would have done something for you. And you know, as he was there, and then they settled everything. How he said, thank God now. All the battles are over. All that I suffered in the house of Laban, everything now is over. And then he counted all the sheep and all the two bands and everything. Look at how rich he is. With my staff, I passed over this Jordan. And now I'm become two bands. And information came that Esau had 400 people. And then he began to pray. And he prayed and he prayed and he prayed. And eventually an angel even came and wrestled with that man. Think about that. I will wrestle with even unseen forces. And eventually he said, your name is changed. You have now prevailed with God and with men. And he said, thank God, thank God. And then marched on. And Esau became softened. And uh, Esau said, let's go together. And he said, no, my Lord. If I found favor in your sight, look at these young ones. That's a good excuse. The young ones. But lest we overdrive them, why not go on your own? And Esau said, can I leave these men with you? He said, no, my Lord. I'll be better without them. If I see them, my heart will be beating. You can go on your own. And he thought that the battles of life were over. Now he's settled now. Thank God, now I'm settled. For the rest of my life now, no more problem. And Dinah went to the Shechemites. And they defiled the Shechemites. And they defiled her. And the brothers, two brothers said, What? To our sister? And he told those people, Circumcise yourself. And he killed all of them. And Jacob said, look at what you have done. We're strangers in this place. Nobody knows us. Look at how small we are. All these people will come and crush me. The thing that I thought was ended, another battle will start again. And then he looked at this uh, young boy, David, uh, sorry, Joseph. And he loved that Joseph. And put, just gave him uh, a coat of many colors. And the other people hated him. Because of that, eventually, Joseph was not. And he said, let me die. The mother is dead. And this boy that I love so much, an animal has torn him to pieces, just let me die. And eventually, after years, 13 years now have passed. And they said that already now, Joseph was still alive. Oh, he said, no. I won't believe. I've been deceived too many times to believe everybody now. It's only God that I can believe. But look at all the chariots and all the things that he has sent. 
He wanted to believe it. Then he went to pray and said, God, are they deceiving me again? And God said, go with them. And he went with them. He got to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said, how old are you? And he remembered all the years. There has not been any resting period. From conception to old age, it was a time of battle. And he said, few are the number of years of thy servant. But they have been full of trouble. That's why the Bible emphasizes faith in that person's life. Without that faith, he will not have been able to carry through. And that's why you need to emphasize faith in your own heart as well. And in your own life. That what you need is faith. Now let's pick up another man. This man, Moses. It was again a life of battles. At birth, the parents had to battle between the will of God and the decree of Pharaoh. The will of God was that this individual should live. And this individual should bring God, bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. But then Pharaoh had made a decree. And it was a battle. It was a battle between life and death. The midwife should have killed Moses, but he didn't. But eventually the mother had to just make um, a basket and then put him there and put him by the brink of Nile. Early in life, instead of uh, actually belonging totally to the mother, even though the mother was taking care of him, he had to belong to Pharaoh's daughter. It was a battle of where did he belong? Did he belong to Egypt or did he belong to Israel? Then eventually because of what he did, he ran away out of Egypt. Well, some of us sometimes will preach and will say, because of what he did, he suffered. How about if he had not done anything? If he had been perfect, no mistake, he would not have suffered at all. You think so? That Satan would have left the man alone who delivered Israel from Egypt? That if the man that delivered Israel from Egypt never made any mistake at all, was perfect and holy, no sin, no mistake of killing that individual, Satan would have left him alone. You know the world in which we live. If a man is perfect and he hasn't any problem at all, has no weakness or frailty at all, the people of the world, if they hate him for bringing Israel out of Egypt, they find something around his feet and they say he has done this. Were not the Egyptians uh, sinners? Were they not servants of Satan? Couldn't Satan use them to bring evil and havoc and harm against the life of Moses? Well, he did what he did, and eventually he ran to Midian. Now, it was a battle of choice. What was he to do in life? To be a lifetime shepherd or leader of God's people out of bondage, as God originally intended. We know it's a battle because... When eventually God came to him and said, you'll go back to Egypt and you'll deliver these people. He said, me, God, choose another person. And he began to give excuses. He had become convinced that he couldn't fulfill that purpose of God. Then he went back eventually to Pharaoh. And before Pharaoh, wasn't that a great battle? As Pharaoh sometimes was threatening, you will see my face no more. But eventually they came out. And they were in the wilderness. Have you counted how many times that the Israelites themselves wanted to stone Moses? Have you counted how many times they rebuked him and chided with him and said, You said you are bringing us to the land flowing with milk and honey. Where is the milk and where is the honey? And it will fall upon his face. It was a battle to get Israel into Canaan. And even the land of Canaan itself. Did he get there? It was a great battle. Then he died. Of course, God honored him and gave him a burial that Israel could not give him. But it's in the New Testament we have the curtain lifted that even on the dead body of Moses, Satan and an angel are to fight. Even on the dead body, saying, oh no, why should he enter? But it's faith. 
that made these people to get through. There is battle. There is battle. Sometimes we see some of those battles. Sometimes we don't even see some of those battles. Sometimes it's only in the spiritual realm. Only in the spirit, only in the heart. But you know many people that don't understand about the battles of life? They feel, well, so-and-so is my problem. So-and-so is my problem. The state overseer is my problem. Or the pastor is my problem. Or that uh, sister that has not agreed to marry me is my problem. Or that brother who cheated me and has not married me is my problem. Oh, if you only knew your problem. You look away from all those things and all those people that are not problems at all. And you know, when you are fighting battles of no consequence, you don't have strength and energy to fight the battles that are really of consequence. When you are fighting the battle and uh, they didn't greet me, uh, they didn't give me good position in church, they didn't make me the coordinator of the house fellowship system, they didn't allow me to be the national or the state evangelist, they didn't allow me to be assistant uh, state overseer. When you are fighting all that battle, the, real, the other real battle you don't know about. And that's why many of us are whipped, because you don't know your enemy. You have not seen where is the enemy actually and fight him. And I believe that from today you'll be a victor. Amen. Because you are discovering that if there is battle in your life, there is nothing strange. For everyone that is significant in the kingdom of God, there will be a battle. That's how life is. That's what brings reward at the end of the day. If there was no fighting, there will be no victory. No battle, then there will be no conqueror. But it's because there is fighting. That's why there are conquerors and victors. And I pray that in your life, you'll be conquerors in Jesus' name. Amen. Now when we talk of battles in life, let's be specific now. There are times we battle with temptation. Now temptations are varied. Many times, some young people are bothered with temptation with women. And they're saying, if I can only get married, if I can only get married, I know that there will be no other temptation in my life. And they go to the state overseer, and they say, state overseer, I love God. I want to worship God. But there's only one battle I have. Only one battle. Once that battle is over, I know that I will do exploits for God. Just let me get married. I know that you state overseers, you've taught us and also we've heard in Lagos at the headquarters church that we must wait for the will of God. We must do this, we must do this, we must do that. But sir, will of God or no will of God, let me settle this marriage. At least I'm the one that is going to get married. Let me marry her. Because once I am married, <laughs> what other battle in life again? And eventually, either by the perfect will of God, or by the permissive will of God, or whichever it is, you get married. Couldn't God hinder that marriage? He could. When you want to marry an unbeliever, couldn't God hinder the marriage? He could. God could go to terrify that unbeliever like he did for Abimelech and terrify her so much that if she sees you like this, she'll be running away. But why doesn't God do it? Sometimes God does it. Sometimes he doesn't do it. Why doesn't he do it? Because God, in his mercy, knows that he needs to convince you that that is not the only battle in life. You are thinking that, let me marry and there is no battle again. God says, okay, I'll, I'll permit you on this one. Go and get married and come back. And it doesn't drive you away from the church. You have been thinking, if I marry that person, I know the state overseer is a man of his word. And he's going to take me out of that job, out of that assignment. And then you go to get married. And you are watching for him to remove you out of that assignment. And God seems to tell him in the heart, saying, leave that young man alone. I'm dealing with him. Don't touch him. 
leave him in that position. All the other workers are saying, uh uh, what's the state overseer doing? Are they not going to remove that individual? And then he too is uh, looking, are they going to make announcement? Are they going to do anything? And there's nothing done at all. And then he says, uh -huh, thank God, my battles are over. And just one month after the marriage, he begins to cry. And another battle has come from nowhere. And he says, I thought my battles are over when I get married. I thought the only temptations are the temptations of women or the temptations of men. And then you begin to understand that there is something beyond the temptation of women. Now, where are you going to run to now? Already you have married. <laughs> what are you going to do now to avoid this other temptation that has come? There's nothing you are going to do. You must learn to have faith. The mistakes of the past are enough. And God is able to forgive and forget. But there's still battle ahead of you. And if you have not learned the lesson of the past, how are you going to be able to overcome and succeed in the future? The battle is there. There are temptations in this world. And many times, because we do not recognize there are more temptations than just the temptations of women, we think that, uh, well, since I'm not tempted to go and commit immorality, then there's no temptation anymore. And you know that sometimes in our own retreats, we do not give messages again on how to overcome temptation. Because is there temptation? Our young people now, they have got married. And even when we give messages about how to overcome temptation, what temptations are we thinking about? The temptations that our young men should not fall into immorality. Our young women should not go into immorality. But Jesus had temptations, not temptations of women. Tense temptation. Serious temptation. Temptations that were higher than the temptations that any man ever had. And yet it wasn't towards women. It wasn't even towards money. And it wasn't towards any of the little, little things that we sometimes mention and we say young men or young women or old men and old women, beware of this, beware of this. There are temptations more than you can categorize and list. And so in the battles of life, we fight and we struggle against the temptations of life. Hi, but after we're sanctified, well, Jesus was more than sanctified, and he was perfect, and yet even after that, there was temptation. Then dealing with opposition and persecution, there are some oppositions that we can easily crush, just stop. But there are some oppositions that even an apostle like Paul will not be able to crush and God will say, my grace is sufficient for you. And he says, God, this messenger of Satan is buffeting me. And he took time off to pray three times. And when Paul prayed, it was prayer. He was fervent about it. And God said, that doesn't disturb my plan for you. And my will for you. Leave it. Leave it in my hand. My grace is sufficient. And so Paul came back and reported to the Corinthians. And maybe they were saying, how about it now? How about it now? And he said, well, now I rejoice and I take glory in infirmities. And in buffeting. And in reproach. And in all those difficulties now, the way I have the victory is to laugh through the storm. Sometimes that's the only way to get the victory. Because God is not going to kill Satan for you. The time is not yet. Study your eschatology very well. The events of the last days. And God is not going to destroy all the false prophets just because of you. Study the scriptures and the prophecies. And God is not going to destroy all the wicked before the day of judgment. The wicked will work stronger and stronger until the evil day. And so what do you do? When Satan will not be killed for you, when the spirit of the Antichrist that is working now will not uh, be annihilated for you, what do you do? You laugh through the storm and you see how to get your victory, even though there is battle. And then 
Sometimes it's a child. We're turning between the two. You are a child of a family, and you are the head of another family. But your parents don't know that you have got married. They still count you as a child, or they count you as a daughter. And you have this responsibility of keeping this family, and it's a Christian family. And you have the other expectation of the people of fitting into that other family, and it's a pagan family. Don't you know that's a battle? That you as a man, at home, they're expecting you. Not just because you are to sacrifice idol. You are to sacrifice to idol. Or you are to do this thing or do that thing that is bad. But because Satan is allowed in that place, and yet God is the head of this family, and there is conflict. Because you still belong to both families. A child in one, a husband in the other. A daughter in one family, and then a wife in the other family. And a struggle is there. And you cannot totally forget that you don't have another family still outside there. And you know how they talk to you. And yet you know what Christ wants you to do in this other family, where you are either husband or, or wife. That's a struggle. It brings in tension. Then there are times of weariness and confusion. I don't know yet of any worker, Christian worker, that has not got some time of weariness. You've consecrated and said, Lord, I will preach. Lord, I will work for you. And before preaching came, you were saying, oh Lord, let them give me opportunity to preach. I like to preach. And you'll pray you're fast, and then you had an opportunity to preach. Oh, you are the happiest man on the face of the earth. And the preaching was so wonderful. You gave in all your heart, all your mind, everything that you have ever known. Eventually, now you are a preacher, and preaching has come. And sometimes you are so weary, and you say, Is today Bible study? And am I supposed to preach today also? So another Sunday has come. And I must preach. And the people are coming. They are excited. They are running and jumping. And they say, we're going to church. Deeper Life Church. And some of the newcomers that are coming for the first time. Oh, they are running. I want to have a seat in the church. And here you are. You are not eager to come. You are weary and tired. Even to find the topic you want to preach. You pushed it on until Saturday night. And the thought kept coming on. And I must preach on Sunday. And, uh, and will I be preaching every time like this? And am I supposed to be feeding these people every time? And uh, no resting time at all? You are weary. Then you are confused. Where do you go in the Bible to preach to the people? You open one part of the Bible, and there's no message there. There's message there, but you can't see. You open another part of the Bible, and there is no message there. There is message there, but you can't see. Then you say, what will I do? You are tempted to close your eyes and close the Bible, and open it and put your finger on one verse. <laughs> And uh, you say, if I do that, will God speak to me? Satan said, no. Your mind said, maybe. And then you open it, and you put your finger on a verse. It looks like a good verse to start with. But then, Lord, how do I develop it? There is no information. How confused you are. Isn't that a battle? And thank God it doesn't continue like that for the whole year. But how you are surprised that within two weeks, that thing is lifted. Not because you prayed. Not because you prayed. But because Christ is interceding for you by the right hand of God. Not because you prayed. Did you, did you pray? Could you pray? You couldn't pray. 
you knelt down and your mind was wandering here and wandering here. What have I done? Is it a witch that is bewitching me? Is it an evil spirit? Or is it just that I'm tired? Or is it because God has forsaken me? What have I done? And in the midst while you are doing that, you have not even started confessing any sin or confessing any weakness. The cloud just lifted. And you said, why have I been feeling like this? I'm a preacher. You grab your Bible. and <laughs> You grab your Bible, and then a passage came out. God gave you the topic, and all the information came. You said, yes, I said so. I'm a preacher. <laughs> but you know that battle of weariness and tiredness and confusion, before it eventually lifts up, you see, sometimes it's in that time of weariness and confusion, some people will pack it up and run away. They don't know it's a battle. And they don't know it's the devil that is battling against their lives. They'll think it is this. They'll think it is that. They'll think it is this. Even some of the people you love so dearly before, you'll think maybe they are the cause of my problem. Now you isolate yourself. You say, well, I just want to sort myself out. And the devil knows that you'll never sort yourself out in the wilderness, in isolation. You know, sometimes the quickest thing for us to do is to say, I will fast. And Satan said, yes, you must fast. How many days? If I can try seven days. And Satan says, seven days for this confusion. For this weariness and dryness, you have no material, you have no unction, you have no anointing, no power. Seven days, you can't try 14 days. I said, yes, I'll try 14 days. Then you run away. I won't tell anybody. I won't tell wife, I won't tell children, or if you're a woman, I won't tell husband. Then you just go away. You pack all your Bibles. And you just go to the wilderness. And the one that is fighting follows you there. And you start that fa uh, fasting. And that very first day, you became hungry like you were never hungry before. It's like you will die. And then eventually you read the Bible, and the devil said, now you are fasting. What are you gaining now in that Bible? What are you getting now? Everything is still dry. And uh, you pray and pray, but you couldn't pray. Eventually, you came back home. About 3.30 in the afternoon. <laughs> you have not finished one day. <laughs> but you wanted to fast for 14 days. I don't know whether it was the choice of that site. That place I went, it doesn't look like I could pray through and get through. Then the condemnation came. There you are. You are not serious with your Christian life. You know what will bring solution to the Christian life that if you can only fast 14 days, all battles are over. You didn't do one day. Then condemnation came. Before it was weariness and confusion. Now condemnation has been added. What do you do? Only Christ can bring us out of that confusion. And thank God he does. And when he does, sometimes we'll wonder, how did I come out of that? So that I will know the formula. So at any time he comes like that again, I will know this is what I did. And there is no formula. Because it's only Christ that did it sovereignly and just by his grace. But there's battle in life. Sometimes it's financial need and spiritual dryness. Sometimes it's disappointment with the present and fear of the future that you are struggling in between all these things but what's the answer faith is the victory and i'm believing god with you and for you others have felt like you are feeling others have gone through what you are going through faith made them to overcome faith will make you to overcome Amen. look at first john chapter 5 Verse 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. 
as we talk about faith, there are some words that are associated with faith. In fact, these are the words that make faith meaningful, dynamic, and powerful. Many times people have tried to have faith alone, faith unseen, faith unfelt, and faith without all these other companions and associates of faith. And because of that, their faith has not worked like it ought to work. But in the battles of life, these are companion words for faith, and they must go along with the faith. They must. If they don't, generally, you may find that you are not actually being able to overcome the way you ought to overcome. Number one is the word trust. Trust. It's a word that we can also translate confidence. Confidence in God's faithfulness. But you say, I thought that is the same as faith. Yet, in a way, it's the same as faith. Because they always go together. And they look so much alike. Trust is, um, in a way, almost passive. That you are resting and relaxing and leaning upon him. It's not so much connected with commanding and praying. It's not so much connected with being very, very active. And it is not so much connected with giving words of authority and uh, words of uh, decree. It's just resting and relying upon him. Totally resting, confidence in God at such a time. And it is that word that makes your faith to really have weight before the Lord. There is no inner fear. There is no inner turmoil. Because you know that you are depending and trusting and resting on the God that is eternal. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 27, from verse 20. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. There was a battle here. There was a tempest here. There was a storm. That Paul the Apostle had to go through in this place, of course with other people, can I remind you that this thing started in a subtle way before this time. That Paul came to Jerusalem and the elders called him and they said, we have heard much about you. And the believers, thousands of them here, they have heard much about you. That they, you have been telling people all over that they should forsake Moses but that they, they will know that there is nothing of this at all. Let's avoid this trouble because they will come together. We have four men here that have vows upon them. These do, according to our word, and there will be no trouble. And Paul, feeling that he should listen to these elders in the church, I mean, important people like James, important people like Simon, important people like John, Pilas in the church, and other people like that, and he listened to them. And then he got to the temple. And then the Israelites came and said, Save us, hell, look at this man that taught men everywhere that they should forsake Moses. And they grabbed him. The very thing he was trying to avoid. We can't always avoid trouble in life. Just please God. If you please God, you displease Satan and there is trouble. But if you please Satan and you displease God, then he forsakes you and there is trouble. And there is no deliverance. If you please men at the expense of forsaking the will of God, again there is inner trouble and there is judgment. And yet if you are pleasing God, there will be opposition and persecution. Where do we run? Nowhere. Just stay in that trouble. And have faith to overcome. You will overcome in Jesus' name. Amen. 
You know, the people that said, when I was in deeper life, there was so much trouble, so much storm, so much tempest. Let me go to a church where there will be no trouble. Have you found a church like that before? A church where there will be no trouble. If they are not following God, they have trouble with God. If they are following Satan, they have problem with Satan. If they don't rebuke evil spirits and witches and wizards, the evil spirits and witches and wizards will be killing them. If they rebuke them, then these witches and wizards will be walking against them. Where is the resting place? There's no resting place. There is no church I will go and then there will be no trouble. I had an overseer of um, a church. The trouble was much. And he called the congregation and he told them point blank and said, look, I know I have a ministry and I have a call. If it is not easy here, I will go to another place and fulfill my ministry. <laughs> There's nothing like that. If he left that church and went to another place to fulfill his ministry, will there not be Satan there, which is there? He'll get into the midst of new people that don't know how to pray for him. And the trouble will be much more. Have you find some of our sisters that have said, I didn't know that this is what marriage is like. I know I cannot remarry, but I'm going to leave this man. How can a person be a Christian, a child of God, and then we are married? And I thought I was marrying the will of God. I'm a Christian, he is a Christian, and I'm having trouble like this. I will pack out. You know what we pastors do? We beg her. And we say, don't pack out. She says, no, I want to pack out. I don't want trouble. I want to live my life so that there will be no trouble. We beg, beg, and beg, and she eventually packs out. And the husband comes to us and he says, my wife has packed out. And we say, why? She said, the trouble is enough. I can't bear any other one. Let me go and rest. And we experience pastors. Now the other pastors who are not experienced, they don't know what, what I'm saying now. The others that are not experienced, they go to that woman, they beg her, they beg her, and he says, no, now I'm resting. Now there's no trouble. I want to enjoy my life. I want to pray. I want to read Bible. We who are experienced will say, husband, leave her alone. <laughs> she doesn't want to see trouble. She thinks that you, husband, and I, the pastor, that we are her trouble. Let trouble leave her alone. Stay in your house. And uh, one week, she doesn't see the husband. Her heart is troubled. Are they not to come? And, are they not coming to beg me? <laughs> and then uh, two weeks sleeping alone, oppression on the bed. I said, ah, what is all this? And uh, the third week, the child is sick. The little child that uh, she has taken away. I said, if these people are not coming to beg me, let me go to them. <laughs> and uh, went to the pastor and said, ah, pastor, I went away. You don't even love me. You didn't come for me. She is begging him directly. And then uh, you say, well, what are you going to do now? Well, since the Bible said, now it's Bible. <laughs> that whatsoever God has joined together, let no man put us under. I don't want the devil to take an advantage of this situation. I think I'll go back to my husband. You'll go back to trouble. No, God will see me through. <laughs> You know, sometimes if we're running from place to place and think that there is no trouble, there is trouble everywhere. But faith is the victory. In the battles of life, have faith and trust in God. I was talking about Paul the Apostle. 
They said so that there will be no trouble. Go into the temple and do this. Doing that, the trouble came. And then he pulled him out, almost to tear him in pieces. And then they rescued him. After rescuing him now, then the son of uh, a relative came to say, Paul, they're going to require from this man that they should bring you out to examine you thoroughly and further. But 40 people have made up their minds that once you come out like that, they'll lynch you. They'll kill you. Before you ever come to that place, 40 people have brought themselves under an oath that if they don't kill you, they're not going to sleep. Say, so go and tell the man. And he told him. And in the night, they whisked him out and put him in the boat. In the boat, the storm came. It was like they were going to die. What's he going to do now? In Jerusalem, they told him to avoid trouble. He got into trouble. At the prison, the son said, they're going to kill you so that I will not go and tell him. Immediately, they made the arrangement, put him in the boat. In the boat, the storm arose with despair of life. With their own hands, they put all their resources, everything in the boat, in the ship, they threw into the river. And eventually, an angel came to him by night and said, Paul, all you see is a foam on the sea, on the wave. Nothing is going to touch your life. There's nothing to panic about. The trouble is there. How be it? We must be upon an island. And the sheep will be destroyed. But as for your life, everything is intact. Clothes may be burnt. Car may be damaged. Material things, iron and glass may be destroyed. Sheep of wood and metals may be destroyed. Nothing will touch your life. Amen. Why are we worried? In any case, the boat did not belong to Paul. And so, an angel came to him. And then he said in verse 21, But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me, and not loosed from Crete, and to have gained uh, these some and laws. And now I exhort you be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the sheep. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am, and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God has given all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, such be of good cheer, for I believe God, that it shall be, even as it was told me. That's trust. He rested in faith. That trusting goes along with the faith. They had been fasting. In fact, Paul too had not eaten for about 14 days. And now he was weak physically. Could he shout and decree and command? All that was not even necessary. The faith and the trust, they go together. That you have faith. You have confidence in God's faithfulness. That he will see you through. The next word that goes along with faith is the word, the all familiar word, prayer. Prayer. Many people do not pray enough because they have faith. But they do not understand that prayer is a companion of faith. And in winning in the battles of life, it goes deeper than just saying, I have faith, I believe, I claim this, I claim that. But really praying, having fellowship with God, communion with the Almighty. Because of our time, I just give you a reference. Luke chapter 18, verses 1 to 8. He started the parable by saying, May not always to pray and not to faint. He ended the parable by saying, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Faith and prayer are companions. And when we pray, it must be prayer of faith. Number three, associates of faith. Companions of faith, promise. Promise. The promise of God. And we should literally live 
in the word of God. Hold those promises as safe. Jesus himself stood in front of you and gave you the promise directly. The Spirit of God will quicken such promise to your heart. And you will take that promise to heart. And you will stand on the promises and you will walk with the promises. In Romans chapter 4, from verse 19, Be not weak in faith, he considered not his own body. You know our problems? We see too much and we consider too many things that we see. If you're up to 20 years of age, you've seen too much already. If you're up to 30 years of age, you've seen too much already. If you have been born again now for some years, you've seen too much already. And if you have been in the Christian work, serving the Lord already, you've seen too much already. You know what this world has given us? They have given us the system of keeping a diary of all our bitter experiences. Most diaries contain more bitter experiences than joyful experiences. What people did, what people said, what you went through, how the constitution was desperate, how this happened, how this happened. And eventually, because of the much you have seen, to believe God in life looks difficult. You know what the diaries make of us? They make us suspect life itself and everybody in life. We're not willing to throw our lives and ourselves into the midst of the trouble. We say, I am avoiding trouble. When somebody says, now, I am wise and intelligent, you know what he means? What he means is that my experiences of the past, they have taught me that I must avoid this type of person, this type of person, this type of person. And you are avoiding success and prosperity. Because it is out of those same people that God is going to bring honey into your life. But because of what we have seen, when I was very young, there were guava trees and orange trees and grapefruit trees all around. But the problem was that many of these uh, trees, as they attracted us little children, they also attracted bees. And many of, the, many of these uh, swarms of bees, they build their nests on the branches of these uh, trees. And uh, <laughs> there was a day. A day we shall forget. <laughs> that we went for the fruit, but were met by the bees. Do you know what it did for us little children? Any time we saw the trees, we didn't remember the fruit, we remembered the bees. That's what experience in life does for you. When you've gone through some experiences, every time you see the trees now, you don't think of the fruit, you think of the bee that stung you. Of the swelling parts of your body. Of the things that, uh, the fangs of uh, those bees that entered into your skin. That's all we remember. And if we avoid the trees because of the bee, you know what happens? We don't have any fruit anymore. But we don't understand because of our experiences that not every tree bearing fruit also has bees on them. And some do. But what does that matter? Shouldn't God make man to be wiser than the bees? Should you reduce all your fruit of the tree to the bees of the field? Shouldn't you find a way 
of scaring away, driving away all those bees so you can recover all your food. We children did not understand that. And many Christians do not understand that. I tried that before the bees stung me. I tried that before, but then I was uh, beaten by a snake. I tried that before, but something happened to me that in life we never see the fruits anymore. But prayer will do a lot. That God himself will give you this faith and you will not see any of these things anymore. You see Abraham? He did not look at the things that are seen. I told you that if you're already 30 years of age, you have seen too much already. You've seen too much already. And if you've been a Christian for five years, for seven years, for ten years, <laughs> you've seen too much. Too, too much. And sometimes, because of our nature, we remember the bee more than the orange that we solved after that. And your mother said, well, even though the bee stung you, yet you sought the orange. You say, yes, but I remember the pain more than the sweetness of the orange. In our experiences in life, what do we remember more? The things that we should forget. The things that are driving us away from the fruit. But that will take faith. But the faith will be joined to the promise of God that will rejoice in the promises of the Lord. And therefore you will not see any of these things that you shouldn't see. You will not consider them. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. But was strong in faith, giving glory to God. He was fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. I'm talking to you on the associates and the companions of faith. Trust then prayer, then the promise. Number four, courage. Courage. When we say we have faith, we don't hide ourselves in the room. We don't hide ourselves away from the battle. The people that we have seen in the Bible that had faith, they went right into the midst of the battle. They had courage. That's the absence of fear. Knowing that God is with me. Before me. Behind me. Beneath me. Underneath are the everlasting arms. Gives you courage. That's what made David to go before that Goliath. And he said, The God who rescued me and gave me victory over the lion and the bear. He'll make this uncircumcised Philistine like one of them. Already we have read, and you can read, write this down, Hebrews chapter 11, verses 32 to 34. The people that subdued kingdoms quenched the flames of fire because of faith. Courage. Number five, Number one was trust. Number two, prayer. Number three, promise. Number four, courage. The absence of fear. Number five, and this is important, action. Moving on while the present seems cloudy and the future seems unsure. Action. Moving on. Moving on. While the present seems cloudy and the future seems uncertain or unsure. That's action. And in Matthew chapter 14, Matthew chapter 14, write this down from verse 24 to verse 32. Jesus told Peter, come. And he came out of the boat. But then, the present and the future became uncertain. He saw the wind boisterous. Because of that, he began to sink. He couldn't stay, take a step anymore just because of the storm. But what Jesus has done was to call him upon the stormy sea. Jesus did not quench or did not um, calm the stormy sea. Just told him to come. 
The storm was there, but Jesus knew that he could walk through the storm. That's why he called him. But because Peter did not understand what Jesus understood, he was afraid and began to sink. He said, Lord, save me. And the Lord said, why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? You should have kept on taking steps, taking action. And my counsel to you this morning is, let's move on. Faith will win the day. And faith will win in life. But don't let your faith be alone. Let the associates surround your faith. Trust, prayer, promise, courage, and action. We have read of these heroes of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. You can become a hero of faith as well. And whatever you are going through, there will be a record in the courts of heaven concerning you. That even though your eyes have seen much, and the waves are beating across or against the back of your ship very much, and that you have gone through a lot like these heroes of faith went through, but all the same, because you've been looking on the author and the finisher of your faith, who is Jesus Christ, you have remained steadfast, immovable, and, and victorious. There will be a record for you. There should be a record for every one of us. Remember, your faith will win in the battle of life. Let's rise up and pray. Amen. Amen. Our Father, I will thank you because your word is food to our soul. Our life is a life of battle. But Lord, above all, we will thank you because you are the man of war. You've been there before us and have promised us that we shall be victorious everywhere we go in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Lord, we thank you because this we shall do by the faith of God in us. Lord, our eyes are open to see that by faith in you we can overcome in all battles. Therefore, Lord, we thank you because as we go on ministering, serving you, preaching your word, we shall remain victorious everywhere we go in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Therefore, Almighty God, give us the grace to trust you. Amen. Give us the grace to go unto you at all times in prayers. When we are tempted to run away, draw us near unto yourself. Amen. Lord, I'm praying as we come near unto you in prayers, give us the grace to see your face in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And fathers will behold your word. Looking at your promises, let us be confident. Amen. Let us be courageous. Amen. Let us march on. Knowing that, Lord, we cannot fail because you are going before us. Lord, I thank you because even this day and all our days, we shall live the life of faith and we shall remain victorious in our walk with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We thank you because we know you have answered us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
to me. I'm going to keep this very short. First of all, I want to thank God for the church. The church has been my family. Um, thank you so much, Pastor Dada. He has been a father to me. I don't start crying. Okay, um, I remember I came here without um, scholarship to Harvard University. The first year wasn't easy, but I got a grant that paid half of my tuition. But then from second year, I got like five different scholarships from my department. I'll be graduating in May. I didn't have to stay out for a I just stayed up for all these conditions. I just blessed you with great.